you know her to be a stranger to the city, a nomad girl, a runaway. You have not seen her before, but a flash of anger runs through you at her touch as you share impossibly in her emotion. You have never felt this or anything else before, and wonder at it. Her hatred is not directed at you, but at the man who compels her to be here tonight. But you still marvel at it as the feeling travels the length of your roof ridge. The girl is familiar. The girl is important. You hear her heart beating, her shallow, nervous breathing, feel the weight of the dagger in its sheath pressing against her leg. There is, however, something missing about her, something incomplete. She and the ghoul boy vanish in through the open door, hurrying through your corridors and rows of offices, then down the side stairs, back to ground level. There are more guards inside, humans, but they're stationed at the vaults on the north side, beneath your grand tower, not here, in this hive of paper and records. The two thieves remain unseen as they descend. They come to one of your side doors, used by clerks and scribes during the day. It's locked and bolted and barred, but the girl picks the lock even as the ghoul scrabbles at the bolts. Now the door's unlocked, but they don't open it yet. The girl presses her eye to the keyhole and watches, waits, until the tallow men pass by again. Her hand fumbles at her throat, as if looking for a necklace that usually rests there, but her neck is bare. She scowls, and the flash of anger at the theft thrills you. You are aware of the ghoul, of his physical presence within you, but you feel the girl far more keenly, share her fretful excitement as she waits for the glow of the tallowman candles to diminish. This, she fears, is the most dangerous part of the whole business. She's wrong. Again, the tallow men turn the corner onto Mercy Street. You want to reassure her that she is safe, that they are out of sight, but you cannot find your voice. No matter. She opens the door a crack and gestures, and the third member of the trio lumbers from the alley. Now, as he thuds across the street in the best approximation of a sprint he's capable of, you see why they needed to open the ground-level door when they already had the roof entrance. The third member of the group is a stone man. You remember when the disease, or curse, first took root in the city. You remember the panic, the debates about internment, about quarantines. The alchemists found a treatment in time, and a full-scale epidemic was forestalled. But there are still outbreaks, patches, leper colonies of sufferers in the city. If the symptoms aren't caught early enough, the result is the motley creature that even now lurches over your threshold. A man whose flesh and bone are slowly transmuting into rock. Those afflicted by the plague grow immensely strong, but every little bit of wear and tear, every injury hastens their calcification. The internal organs are the last to go, so towards the end they are living statues, unable to move or see, locked forever in place, labouring to breathe, kept alive only by the charity of others. This stone man is not yet paralysed, though he moves awkwardly, dragging his right leg. The girl winces at the noise as she shuts the door behind him, but you feel an equally unfamiliar thrill of joy and relief as her friend reaches the safety of their hiding place. The ghoul's already moving, racing down the long silent corridor that's usually thronged with prisoners and guards, witnesses and jurists, lawyers and liars. He runs on all fours like a grey dog. The girl and the stone man follow. She stays low, but he's not that flexible. Fortunately, the corridor does not look out directly onto the street outside, so even if the patrolling talamen glanced this way, they wouldn't see him. The thieves are looking for something. They check one record room, then another. These rooms are secure, locked away behind iron doors, but stone is stronger, and the stone man bends or breaks them one by one, enough for the ghoul or the human girl to wriggle through and search. At one point, the girl grabs the stone man's elbow to hasten him along. A native of the city would never do such a thing, not willingly, not unless they had the alchemist's cure to hand. The curse is contagious. They search another room, and another, and another. There are hundreds of thousands of papers here, organised by a scheme...